Good morning, friends. I'm so glad you decided to join me to get your day started with a biblical perspective here on A Moment with Hales. We are going to continue on this Friday into our Colossians series, so I hope you enjoy. All right, just to do a quick recap, again, we're in Colossians. Paul wrote the book of Colossians while he was imprisoned, and he wrote it to refute some of the false teachings and that was going on in the Colossians church and also to encourage them to continue to grow in their spiritual maturity. He just finished in our last episode talking about legalism and how we are not to judge each other for certain traditions and we don't need to be doing rituals anymore since we have Jesus. And he also talked about the modelship that Christ gave of leadership in the church, and it was not him wielding his power and authority over people. He was serving his disciples by washing their feet. So we have a responsibility to one another and not authority over each other in the church. And Paul also talks about how Christ is the head of the church, and we have Uh, scripture as our guideline and we are supposed to be working with the Holy Spirit to grow in our own spiritual maturity and be personally responsible for how we apply our spiritual growth and biblical understanding in our own lives. So jumping into Colossians 2 18 through 19 it says do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the false worships of angels disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. The false teachers were attempting to pull the believers away from God by placing value in appearances, mixing Christianity with pagan practices like the Gnosticism, which we talked about, which they do worship angels, and validating their faith through mystical experiences and seeing value in themselves apart from God. And let's remember too, Paul opened up this book or in one of the chapters and was saying that he was praying for them that they would gain knowledge. He didn't pray that they would have a spiritual experience. He prayed that they would gain knowledge through Christ. And here, Paul lists out four ways in which the Colossians were not to be defrauded. First, delighting in false humility. The evidence of a man-made religion is the appearance of humility. Appearing humble may work with people, but it will not work with God. Secondly, Paul talks about delighting in the worship of angels. There has always been a fascination with angels. The Bible is clear that angels are not to be worshipped. Number three, entering into visions. Here are claims to spiritual superiority validated by claims of a higher religious experience through mysticism. And lastly, inflated pride. In the passage, it talks about being inflated without cause, or in the one that I read out of the NIV, it says they are puffed up with idle notions. Whatever is going on here, it's not exactly clear, but it is against God just as pride is an anti-God state of mind. We are not to be prideful. These alterations or deviations were based within a worldly religion and pointed away from Christ. Paul emphasized that they must be connected to the head of the church, Christ. We see this theme all throughout Colossians being connected to the head. These fanciful notions and legal mystics were actually a result of the loss of connection with the head. Without Christ, there is only emptiness. Only a relationship with Christ alone can produce the growth of spiritual transformation. Just a quick question for you, not necessarily a point of reflection, but just a thought. What alternatives or deviations are currently infiltrating Christianity or the church today that point away from Christ? And moving on to Colossians 2, 20 through 23, it says, well, Paul writes, (laughs) if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to degrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which refer to all things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments of the teaching of man? These are matters which do have the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and humility and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. So first of all, every believer has been co-crucified with Christ. Okay, what does that actually mean? This context speaks metaphorically of a believer's death to sin, self, Satan, the law, and the world. 
through Christ, we now have eternal perspective and purpose to live for. Rather than just temporary pursuits of the world, we are no longer obligated to obey our fleshly inclinations. We are not accountable to our flesh. We are not accountable to the world. We are not accountable to sin. Only those alive to sin need to obey its master. We have been set free. We serve a new master. We have a new purpose that is very, very different than the world. And secondly, Paul also talks about legalism here. The persistent example of legalism in the New Testament and the Old Testament is the commandment of circumcision, which is intended for the Jews as a sign of faith, but the legalists wanted to make it a condition of grace. You kind of see that all weaved, an argument for this weaved throughout the New Testament. And again, I want to say too, Paul's mission journey, if you will, was to bring the Gentiles into Christianity. And obviously, the Jews were really taken back by that when Christianity was open to everybody. So I think Paul was pretty clear, we can't be bringing in all these extra things. That's not what's needed for God's grace. And because of Jesus, we don't have to follow these things. So it was very confusing, I'm sure, when they were told, hey, yes, okay, Jesus died, rose again, whatever. You you can be a believer through him, but you do need to do A, B, and C, you know, where it's just freedom. You have freedom. Now, obviously, with, like we talked about in the last episode, with the freedom comes responsibility, accountability, and you will go through the sanctification process, but you there's no A, B, and C. There's just Jesus. That's it. So living by self-made religious standards has a a certain appearance of wisdom, but is ultimately striving to deny ourselves to achieve man-made guidelines isn't the goal. The goal is dealing with sin in our lives. And sin is no longer our master because we are freed from the sin and guilt through Christ. And moving on to Colossians, we're moving to chapter three. It says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Not only does Paul make the point previously that we have died with Christ, but he, we also have been raised with Christ. Being raised with Christ results in a changed perspective. Paul encourages them to seek and set their mind on things above as maintaining to an eternal perspective. I like that he uses the phrase, keep seeking. It's current. It means to earnestly strive to find something, to devote serious effort to realize one's desire or objective, to aim or try to obtain some state or condition. Practically seeking things above involves giving your attention to Jesus in order to find him. So giving him first place in everything, giving him priority, desiring him above anything on this earth, continually making deliberate choices to follow him daily, to obey him and to think about him, to meditate on his life-giving word. This three-part test really involves your checkbook, your calendar, and your home. The phrase to set your mind is active. To set your mind on something involves an act of one's will. It is something we must choose to do. To to set is continual. It is written in present tense because it's habitual. It's learned. I'll give you an example. When we have a sporting event, a play, a speech, a job interview, whatever, we prepare. We get ourselves mentally, physically, and emotionally ready. This takes intentionality and planning. The same strategy should be applied to setting our minds on things above. Developing an eternal mindset doesn't just happen. We don't just become a Christian and say, oh, now I'm not worried about anything. It's intentional. It's learned. It's encouraged. And ultimately, it's up to us to create that mindset. Sure, we can ask and pray the Lord to help us to develop it. But at the end of the day, maintaining a daily biblical perspective is a discipline. And it's developed with really hard work. Moving on to Colossians 3, 3 through 4, it says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. So when Paul says your life is hidden with Christ in God, what does that mean? Well, there are three suggestions given to the ver- with the verb hidden. So first, safety or security. Believers are permanently hidden or securely locked together with Christ. 
Secondly, identity. Believers are now intimately linked together with Christ and God. Like you're almost hidden with him because your identity is is just with him. Or security. Thus, his bent of life is directed towards its source away from the visible and the carnal. So life is basically secure because it's so hidden, I guess, or so bent in the eternal, it's almost hidden, I guess. The other word used here is with Christ and God. With conveys the picture of an intimate union, bringing out the truth that we are now in a new relationship with him and our oneness and identity is with Christ. Believers now share a common life with the father and the son. The second verse indicates that our life is not hidden forever because it does say we will be revealed with him in glory. Now, I'm going to say this is a really, really debated passage of scripture. What do you know? So I'm just going to go with the interpretation that I found. But if you want to research it more, there's a lot of debates on what does it really mean for for us to be revealed. Revealed means to be visible or make appear. Paul makes the point that Christ does not merely give his life, that he is life. As Jesus said in John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus himself is the is in the believer. Our life is hidden with Christ. Essentially, as a believer grows in their spiritual maturity, Christ will no longer be hidden. He will be revealed because our life will reflect Christ to others. Jesus said in John 17, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. In a sense here, the Colossians are an answer to Jesus' prayer. Life with Christ is an endless hope. Without him, life is a hopeless end. All that we long to become, we will find fulfillment in when we see Jesus. Even though Jesus has spoke the truth in a powerful, irrefutable way, and even though his works spoke for themselves, he did not receive the recognition he truly deserved. Yet someday, everyone will bow before him and give him the honor and dues his name deserves. Even though our beginnings may seem insignificant, we can look forward to a glorious and happy ending with Jesus. And just a few points to reflect on today. In what aspects of your life is it the most difficult to maintain an eternal perspective? How does understanding that your identity is found within Christ impact your confidence? Is your spiritual growth revealing Christ to others? And what does that practically look like in your season? How can you start developing the discipline of setting your mind on things above? Well, thanks for listening, friends. Happy Friday. I hope you all have fabulous weekends, and I'll be talking to you soon.